if we have a little bit more time, I want to talk something about a topic that is near and dear to both of our hearts, which is temperature. Um, you know my journey on the sauna train, right? I was probably the biggest sauna skeptic for many years. Um, not because I didn't love it. I loved, I've always loved a sauna. I just had a hard time believing that the data were causal, right? I was just like, there's too much healthy user bias in here. Um, but, you know, over the last five years, as I've looked closer and closer at the data, um, while I can't comment on the effect size, I think it's very difficult to comment on the effect size from all the epidemiology, it's very difficult for me to believe that there isn't a positive effect in terms of at least cardiovascular disease and dementia. Um, so that those are my priors. My priors are I'm now in a place where I actually view sauna as an intervention that can help an individual reduce their risk. And for me personally, because I don't really worry about cardiovascular disease anymore, it's so easy to manage the risk around that otherwise. But dementia is a very difficult risk to manage because you know, there's fewer things we understand about the causal pathways to get there than we do ASCVD. So in many ways, I'm in the sauna, not just because I enjoy it, not just because it's a wonderful social opportunity to be with your spouse, if that's how you choose to do it, but because I'm also banking a little bit on, hey, I want to get some benefit to my brain. So tell us where you are currently, because I, you're one of the people who I think keeps up with this literature more than anybody. So tell us if anything has changed in your mind, one way or the other, both in increasing confidence, decreasing confidence, you know, just, just update us on where you are. Yeah. I, I am still a huge proponent of using deliberate heat exposure to improve your health, both cardiovascular and brain. I do think that the physiological mechanisms um, are s somewhat in many, in, in some ways, mimicking some aspects of moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise, and that is how it is improving cardiovascular health and also a, an, a, an aspect of that brain health. Um, cardiorespiratory fitness, that's been shown. There's been not only like observational data, but there's been intervention studies looking at endurance, getting someone on a stationary cycle and then adding the sauna on top of that. And VO2 max improvements were greater in individuals that are also doing the sauna right after yep. their training. So um, anything that improves cardiovascular health is going to improve brain health. But there's another aspect to the story here, and this kind of dates back to like the origins of my like one of my first biology, you know, experiments I did in um, when I was actually a technician at the Salk Institute before I went to graduate school, and that has to do with the heat shock protein response. And so we do know that heat stress in the form of either hot baths or going into a hot sauna. E infrared sauna a little different you'd have to stay in there really long or like a long time to get to get a real heat shock response but if you're in like 163 degree fahrenheit sauna for 30 minutes we know that heat shock proteins increase about 50 uh, percent over baseline heat shock proteins and what would be the equivalent exposure in steam or water in the water, it's about 104 degrees for 20 minutes, like shoulders down. Okay. So you're 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, about 20 minutes. And then presumably, if you're in a hotter, dry sauna, less time is needed. Presumably, uh, we don't have that data. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just quoting the data we that we the empirical data that and, we have. And what? Tell me more about the IR because there are no questions I get asked more mm -hmm. than hey, are all the benefits you're talking about, which all seem to come from studies in dry sauna, are they also applicable to, to infrared saunas, to which the only data I can find is if you're using infrared, you actually have to rely on the change in skin temperature to know you've hit the, whereas in, sa in dry sauna, we can look at time and temperature and humidity, right? Like if I know the temperature of the sauna, the humidity of the sauna, and then the duration that you're in there, I know what I know how to measure the effect size. We can't do that in IR. So we looked at some data that, that looked at basically thermal skin change. And I, I can't remember the number, so I don't want to get it wrong. It was either five or eight degree increase in skin temperature was necessary to produce similar benefits. What do you do you know about this? I so I had not that I don't know specifically about that, but I do know most of the studies that have been done comparing, and there have not been many, maybe three or four that I can think of. They have compared a regular hot sauna to infrared sauna at the same amount of time. So in other words, the dose is the same. Obviously, the temperature difference is 
pretty vast. Depending on the study, the hot sauna could be, you know, 160 or it could be 175 or 180. And the infrared is like 140 or something like that, right? So a lot of variation in terms of, you know, the temperature of the saunas. If you're looking at, there, there have been, in fact, there's like one study, like the title of something like infrared saunas or something, like does not mimic cardiovascular effects of exercise or something like that. And that's because at this the given dose, right? If you're just doing like 20 or 30 minutes, it's not going to be the same. Like your heart rate doesn't go up as much. You don't feel as hot because the temperature is not as hot. Now you will sweat based on a different mechanism. But as far as my take of the literature, it's pretty clear to me that infrared saunas, if you want it to mimic the cardiovascular exercise response, you might have to double that. You might the have duration. to duration. Yeah. So rather than spending 20 minutes in a 175 degree, 180 degree sauna, you're going to spend 40 minutes. Wow. Right? Yeah. So you're giving up your time mm -hmm. if that's the kind of sauna that you either have or enjoy. Because you, if you do, and I've been in infrared saunas many times, if you stay in long enough, like you get that, you feel hot and you feel that like heart rate going up just like you do when you're in a hot sauna. It just takes a lot longer. Um, now, I know you've had Dr. Ashley Mason on this on, um, on your, your podcast. She's been on my podcast as well. I've been, I'm a, we collaborate. Isn't she awesome? She's awesome. Just love her. She's awesome. And we collaborate on a variety of sauna studies. She does a lot of, she wears a lot of hats. And her data looking at, you know, she's a psychologist by training and she looks at depression and she's looking at depression as an endpoint in terms of, you know, these infrared saunas. And she's looking at core body temperature increases, right? So people, their core body temperature is going up by like almost two degrees. And um, in, the, in that case, I mean, she's got them in an in infrared sauna for like 85 minutes. People with major depressive disorder were exposed to this this you know, device where they're heating heating up their core body temperature by about two degrees. And they had an antidepressant effect that lasted six months compared to a sham control, which was also heating people up, but not- Single treatment? Single treatment. Now, Ashley has gone out and she's done four to eight treatments, depending on you know the person, whether or not they f completed the whole study. Um, and, and she didn't have a sham control, but she's got an, a just phenomenal- How do you sham device. control that? So he, so what he did in his study was he had the same device that just got people a little bit warm, enough where they were thinking they were getting the active treatment, but it was not- Didn't hit the threshold. Of two, yeah, raising their core body temperature by two degrees. It was a phenomenal study. Um, and this is, by the way, Peter, what got me interested in the sauna back in like 2008 when I started doing it like every day, was I was, I lived across the street from OMCA and I was going into the sauna in the morning, it was freezing in Tennessee, and I was going to the sauna in the morning before I would go into the lab to do my experiments. And I was going every single morning and staying in a long time because I was like, you know, I'm like, go hard, go home kind of thing. And I love the heat. And it was incredible the effect it was having on my mental health and my ability to deal with stress and anxiety so much that I was like, this is insane. What's going on? Nothing has changed other than I'm going to the sauna every day before I go and do all my failed experiments. And that's kind of what got me mm. into the whole sauna was actually the effect on my mental health. So it's kind of fun to go full circle and um, team up with Ashley on some of this this research as well. And she's amazing, by the way. And and we've got some. She's got some new studies coming out that are really in this whole field of sauna depression. I think just she's opening the door. So um, that said, the effect on the head. And you know, if you think about like hot tubs, jacuzzis, right? We're all sitting with our head out as well, right? Mm -hmm. We're in there and. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a good question because I agree with you when I'm in a hot sauna and I'm also on the top and it's like the same deal. I want to get out in 20 minutes. If I stay in too long, I will get a headache. And I, I've know my, I know my threshold now. I know the temperature and the duration and the amount of water and all that. Like I know all those variables. Isn't it amazing how much water you can drink in a sauna? Like I, just, I know it's, it's, I worry it, I'm going to get hyponatremia. I'm like, you got to slow this down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is, is that talking about dementia risk, I talked about heat shock proteins and I, I kind of didn't even, I like went off on this tangent, sorry. But the heat shock proteins, what they do is they prevent proteins from misfolding and forming aggregates, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's, 
obviously when you're getting into a hot sauna, you are denaturing some proteins. And so your heat shock proteins are a stress response that's activated to help with the proper folding of those proteins that were kind of denatured somewhat from the heat that you were exposing yourself to. Well, it turns out the heat shock proteins stay active for a long time. And so they end up having this like effect where you're now just improving the folding of proteins in general, even after you're out of the hot sauna, right? So um, he, there's a lot of animal studies that have been done. I did a lot of studies in worms like many, many years ago where you can take amyloid beta 42, inject it into a worm muscle tissue, and then activate heat shock proteins. And it like prevents the aggregation and it prevents the, the muscle sort of paralysis that occurs in these worms. Animal studies have been done looking at amyloid beta and heat shock proteins and Alzheimer's disease. Again, it's having a protective effect. Now, is that the whole story? No. The cardiovascular effects are also important for brain health, in my opinion, right? You know the data coming out of Dr. Yari Lakunin's lab showing that dementia and Alzheimer's disease risk is 66% lower in people that are using the sauna four to seven times per week versus just one time a week. Of course, all and that was at 179 degrees or greater for 20 minutes or greater, right? Yeah, like 175 or 179, exactly, for 20 minutes. Um, now, here's where your question comes in, and that is like, what about the head? And there was another study out of Finland. It was not Yari's lab. It was another professor that I, I, I'm not aware of. But um, this study looked at sauna use and dementia risk, and then it sort of it stratified the data based on temperature. And it was protective again. People that are using the sauna, again, they're getting a protective effect against dementia. But when people were going extreme, so if they're going above 200 degrees Fahrenheit and they're on average, it was like if they're getting to like 212, people do this, by the way. This is like you can go on yep. Instagram and see it's a, not an uncommon thing. Their dementia risk was actually increased with that temperature where it was like really hot. And my concern is the head at that high of a temperature. I've started wearing one of those. Um, sauna hats. The sauna hats. Yeah. yeah. I, it, it, and again, I don't know why it works. Do you? Um, it I mean, it doesn't. It's, it's not logical to me why it's hurting. It's, uh, why it's helping, rather. I don't know. It's, it does seem to help. <laughs> I mean, it shields probably some of the heat that you're being exposed to, right? Because there's got to be yeah, I suppose. But but, it, but the fact that that's a net benefit because it's also got to be preventing you from dissipating heat. But True. clearly, what it's preventing it's coming in coming is in. exceeds what. But but it makes such a difference. Um, those, I mean, these cultures and like But I've, Finland, also, I've also it. dialed mine down a little bit. I used yeah. to be consistently going to at least 200. And now I'm like, you know what? Honestly, like 185 to 190 is good enough. I'm 180. I do 180. And well, my wife is going to be very happy if we dial it down to 180. Cause yeah. Because she, uh, she seems more sensitive to the heat than I am. I'm more sensitive to the heat than my husband is as well. I wonder if there's some kind of sex thing where, yeah, if it's it's definitely like I'm, I'm more sensitive to it. So, so that's great. So, th but this is important. So, you really think that we could even dial it to 180? Uh, absolutely. And just, and just totally get the same. That's, I mean, the data is showing. That. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just, I, you know, me. More is better. It, more is better. I'm not, not just you. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a common, you know, it's like go hard, go home, right? Um, but I do think with you, you, we're talking about a type of stress here, right? Yeah, he, and you have to get it hormetically correct. Exactly, exactly. That's you know, I, I don't know that the 212, and I hope people that are out there doing the 212 are like listening to this because it's too it's too hot. It, you, there's no need for it. You're not. There's no evidence you're getting added benefit, and if anything, there's potential benefit, potential, potential risk that you're exactly getting potential risk downside. I don't. You know, that's just one study. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.